Hi, everybody. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, yes, my name is Peter Hoffmann. Um, you can see my Twitter handle, at Peter Hoffmann, and you can find afterwards the slide at github.com uh, slash blueyander. Um, before I start my talk, um, a little bit about me and about Blue Yonder. So what do I do? I'm a software developer at Blue Yonder. Um, Blue Yonder is providing predictive analytics as a service, and I think with more than 100 data scientists, we have one of the biggest data science team uh, in Germany. Uh, our stack is mostly Python, um, and we are um, building a platform where we run our machine learning algorithms on top of it. Um, you see here, we are 10 people from Blue Yonder uh, at the EuroPython, and we have nine talks. So after me, you have still uh, the chance to see three other people from uh, Blue Yonder. Um, you can see tomorrow uh, Moritz uh, talking about testing and fuzzy testing. You can see Christian talking about bulk data storage with SQL Alchemy. And you can see Florian talking about uh, bots. And last but not least, uh, Philip, um, is the, I think he will present what uh, Blue Yonder really does. So let's start in um, about what is uh, Spark. So Spark is a distributed general purpose uh, computation engine. Uh, it has APIs to Scala, uh, Java, R, and Python. And it's mostly uh, for machine learning and distributed computing. Um, Spark has one core API that's a resilient distributed data set. And based on this core API, all other APIs are sitting on top. And Spark is, um, it runs on a cluster, so it, on multiple machines. Um, you can use different, different schedulers uh, to run Spark on a cluster, like a standalone scheduler. You can use the Hadoop um, Yarn scheduler, or you can run Spark uh, on Mesos. Uh, on top of Spark Core, there are sitting several libraries. Um, the important, or the most important one is Spark SQL, or the Spark Data Frame API. Then there's Spark Streaming, uh, where you can uh, uh, calculate based on micro batches. Um, you can do stream computing. There's the MLlib library for uh, machine learning. And there's the GraphX library, which is for graph processing. Spark itself is written in Scala and runs on the virtual machine, uh, the, the Java virtual machine. And it is responsible for the memory management, for fault recovery, and interaction with other storage systems. Uh, Spark sits on top of the Hadoop stack, so Spark can access every uh, data source that the Hadoop stack uh, provides in standalone mode. So the core um, library of Spark is the RDD, the Resilient Distributed Data Set, and the RDD is a logical plan to compute data based on other data sets. RDDs are fully uh, fault tolerant so that a system can uh, recover from the loss of single nodes in your cluster or from single failures in a calculation of parts of your RDDs. Spark will then rerun uh, the calculation and try to recover from uh, a machine failure. There are two basic principles uh, how you can interact with RDDs. The first one is through transformations. So a transformation always takes one or more RDDs as an input and has an RDD as an output. Transformations are always lazy. That means they are not calculated on the fly, but they are calculated when you um, call an action on an RDD. And action are the, the, the last step in a, in a calculation plan where you really want to collect the data. So you can take uh, some uh, rows of your data, you can get all, you can call, count the result set, and then the data or the calculation will really be run and you'll get back your, uh, your data. Spark tries um, to minimize uh, data shuffling between the nodes in your cluster. And in contrast to the Hadoop uh, stack, it doesn't write all intermediate results uh, to, the, uh, to the file system, but it tries to keep them in memory. And therefore, uh, Spark, if your data fits into memory, uh, in the memory of your cluster, it's much, it's much faster than traditional uh, MapReduce stacks. If you um, combine multiple transformations um, with your RDDs, you'll get the RDD lineage graph. That means um, that 
based on your partition um, of your input data, you can have a lot of transformations one after another, and Spark uh, tries uh, to group these transformations together and when possible run them on the same node. Many transformations are element-wise, that means they can only work on an element at a time, um, but it's not true for all operations. Operations like group by or join um, operations work on multiple elements. And as I said earlier, um, actions are then used to get the result back and to return it to your driver program. Um, if you know Hadoop or the, the traditional map reduce um, programming model, there are only map and reduce steps. Uh, while Spark has much more transformations, it has the map and the reduce um, computations, but it also has things like flat map, has a filter, has a sample function. You can do unions of multiple data sets. You can do an intersection. You can uh, group uh, the data by keys. You can aggregate it by keys and you can do fully join inner, outer, and uh, right outer joins of your data sets. What's important for Spark is that it knows the partition of your input files and knows, knows the data locality of your partitions because it always try um, to run your calculations where the data is. So Spark tries uh, to bring the algorithms to your data and minimize uh, shuffling data around in your clusters. So you have a set of partitions which are atomic pieces of your data set, and you have a set of dependencies based on parent RDDs, and you have always functions which will calculate um, RDDs based on your parent uh, RDDs. Spark needs uh, to know about the metadata of uh, your data, to know where your data is located, to be able to do data local um, computation. So that data shuffle, which is expensive and which will really slow down your calculations, is only done when it's necessary. As I said earlier, uh, Spark is implemented in, in, uh, in uh, Scala and runs on the Java virtual machine. So what is PySpark? Uh, PySpark is a set of bindings or APIs uh, which sits on top of the Spark programming model and which uh, expose the programming model to your Python programs. So that's the famous word count um, example. What you do is you always start with an, with an input RDD, that's some kind of basic file system operations. Uh, here you can load a text file from an HDFS, and then you have the normal MapReduce steps where you split the lines by white space, then you will emit um, each word with a number, and then you do a reducement where you calculate the occurrences of the words. Um, as Python is uh, dynamically typed, um, it's possible that your RDDs can hold uh, objects of different types. That's not possible in the Java uh, version, but the Scala version also has this possibility. Uh, at the moment, PySpark not supports all APIs that are supported in the Scala version. Um, for the data frame, they are nearly provide everything, but um, for streaming, uh, PySpark always lags one or two versions behind the normal uh, Scala APIs. So here you see how it's done. You always have a driver context that's on your local machine. Um, you can. I, as I show later, you can have an IPython session or run your normal Python program. This will then connect to a Spark context, which will talk over Py4j uh, to the Java virtual machine on your host, which will then talk to the workers, and each worker will again talk to Python or to uh, JVM. It depends what kind of calculations you do. On top of the RDDs, there's the relational data processing in Spark. Um, that's a relatively new API. It um, has been added to the APIs in Spark 1.4 only two months ago. And um, it's a new kind to work uh, on a higher level with your data uh, through declarative queries and optimized storage engines. It provides a programming abstraction called data frames. 
and it also acts as a distributed SQL query engine. Um, I'll show you later how you interact. And what's a really nice thing is that the query uh, optimizer, the catalyst optimizer, works the same for Java, Scala, and Python. So you'll gain the same speed in your Python programs as you will gain with the Scala programs. And the data frame API provides a rich set of uh, relational operations. So you can interact through different APIs with the data frame API. You can connect it through GC, so every um, Java program can talk to it through the normal JDBC uh, API. You can directly talk to it through user programs in Python, Java, and Scala, and you can also switch between the data frame API and the raw LED API. So what's a data frame? A data frame is a distributed collection of rows grouped into named columns with a schema. And it has a high level API for common data processing talks. That's projection, filtering, aggregation, join, and it has metadata, sampling, and user-defined functions. So you can define your user-defined function in Python and use it in the SQL statements in uh, the SQL queries. As with the RDDs, data frames are executed lazy. That means each data um, uh, frame object also only represents a logical plan, how to compute the data set, and the computing is, uh, um, is hold on until you really call an output action. A data frame, you can see it as an equivalent to a relational table in Spark SQL. And you can create it through various functions using a SQL uh, context. Um, and then once you have created it, you can um, operate it on it through a declarative domain-specific language. So here, you just, we just load a, a, a people's JSON file, which has some rows of, uh, of JSON. And then you can, like you um, know it from SQL Alchemy or maybe from Pandas, you can do filtering, selecting, projection, um, and get your data back. And if you compare these two statements, so the first one is in the declarative Python way, the second one is a SQL way, and they result in the same um, execution plan on or in Spark itself. So it's only declarative. If you, if you write it in Python, you'll get the same speed as the plain SQL um, one or the one you define in Scala. Uh, why is this possible? It's possible because Spark has the Catalyst uh, query optimization framework, which works for all uh, languages which use the data frame API. Um, it's implemented in Scala and uses uh, features like pattern matching and runtime metaprogramming to allow developers um, to specify complex relation and relational optimizations. And as you can see, that's from the Spark website. Um, if you work with the plain RDDs, the Python version is always lower than the Scala version, but if you sit on top of the data frame API where you only use declarative statements, then you'll get the same speed up as in Scala. So how do you talk to your data? Um, as I said before, Spark works on top of Hadoop, so you can access all the Hadoop um, file system and drivers that are available there through the data uh, source API. So you can talk to Hive tables, you can read in Avro files, CSV files, JSON files, you can read and store the data in the Parquet columnar format, and you can also connect to normal JDBC databases. Uh, I'll go into little into detail into the Parquet data format um, because I think that's a, a really great way to work and store data um, from Spark. So Parquet is a columnar format uh, that's supported by many data processing systems and you can store uh, the Parquet data format in chunks into an Hadoop HDFS file system. Um, Parquet automatically preserves the schema of the original data and as you can see here, if you have a table with three columns, the normal row-oriented storage is that you write each row after row 
and the column-oriented storage is that you um, save your data in column order, and it had, diff uh, had several advantages. The first one is normally in one column there's similar data, so compression works much better if you block and code um, column-wise data. And then if you have uh, data with many columns and you don't want to access all columns every time, it's much faster access to just um, access some columns at a time. The data frame API is able to do uh, prediction and projection pushdown. That means if your underlying storage um, is able to uh, work with vertical partitioning or horizontal partitioning, the Spark data frame API can push down the predicate to your storage engine and don't have has to read all the data into Spark, but let the storage engine uh, do the hard work. So you can see here, Vertical pro, uh, partitioning, that means you only want to have the column B, and maybe you have um, some predicates on some rows, so you will see, uh, say, okay, I want only want the, the rows where A is A2 and C is in C4 and 5, so you can split this up and only will read the result into Spark to, for further processing. The Data Frame API uh, not only supports tabular data, um, uh, it has basic types like numeric types, string types, and byte types, but it also supply, um, provides support for complex types and nested types, so you can build, build tree-like data and access tree-like data from the Data Frame API. You always have to provide a schema, or the data has a schema, there are two ways to get the schema into your data frame. The first one is um, to do um, schema inference. Um, this works with typed input data like Avro, Parquet, or JSON files, or with a normal example with dict files where it can guess um, the data types uh, for your data frame. Or um, you can specify the, the, the schema by yourself. So here we want to read in a normal CSV file and we define a struct type with several fields and we add to the fields um, the type of the field. This is a call um, to see what are the important uh, classes of your Spark SQL and data frames. So you have the context, that's the main entry point to interact with a data frame with SQL-like functionality. You have the data frame, which is the distributed collection of group data and you have columns, um, expressions, which you can work on your data frame. A row is a row in the data frame, and group data is data you get from aggregation, aggregation methods like group by. And you have, as, as I said earlier, the types where you describe the schema. So when you have a data frame, you know, that uh, looks like pandas, I think. Uh, you can select, you can filter, you can group by, and work on the data as you do on a no local machine, but you really uh, work on a cluster. And that's what I want to show. Um, so I'll show you a little example. It's uh, from uh, the GitHub uh, archive. So the GitHub archive stalls all the events that are on GitHub uh, for the last half year that are seven, uh, 27 gigabytes of JSON data about seven million events, and now all my colleagues said don't do it, but we'll try it anyhow um, to do a live demo and connect to the cluster. And it, so it's a little bit too small, but I think we'll get it. And uh, also, uh, Oh, this will not work. So I also wanted to show you the cluster, but this will not work at all. So I'll try to only uh, go through the programming statements. So we always uh, start with a SQL context. That's our entry point where we uh, connect to the cluster. I have here a cluster with four machines, uh, each 40 cores, and about one terabyte of RAM uh, in total. So what we do, we just uh, want to read a single text file or JSON file uh, that's one hour from one day uh, into, into the cluster. You see it here, how to get it. You will say, um, this context, get the text files, um, take one, so we'll dump it out. We, what we see, it's normal JSON, but it's a hierarchical JSON. 
But as I said earlier, that's no problem because uh, Spark can work with uh, hierarchical data. Now we read it in uh, as a JSON, so it auto detects the schema. So now we read in the data and Spark auto detects the schema. So what we see for each e event, we have um, an, an actor, that's the, the person who committed um, to, the, uh, to, the, to, to GitHub. We have a created uh, version, we have uh, some payload, and we have the type of the event at, at the bottom, like a pull request or something like that. And that's uh, Spark automatically detects the schema, so we don't have to do anything. So now let's uh, try to work on the whole data, not only one hour from one day, but work on all events uh, from the last half year from GitHub. Have a look how much uh, events we've got. So now from my MacBook, which doesn't have that much memory, we're working on 70 million e events. Um, let's have a look at how uh, many uh, pull or how many events were in the Apache Spark repo in the last. Uh, half year, so roughly 60,000, or have, um, let's uh, have again look uh, who are the top committers in this Apache Spark uh, repo, and show it. So now all the calculation is done on the cluster, uh, and only the result set uh, comes back to my IPython notebook. So that's pretty cool um, because you now work on much bigger machines and don't have to do the calculation at uh, your laptop. And you also can al always register uh, data frames um, to the SQL that you can also um, run normal SQL statements um, instead of using the Python um, declarative language. So that's the demo. Then a little summary, what's, what's Spark? So Spark is the distributed general purpose cluster computation engine, and PySpark uh, is an API to it. The resilient distributed data set is all a logical plan to work on your data. Data frames are high level extract, extract, abstraction um, that are a collection of rows grouped into named columns with a schema, and the data frame API allows you to manipulate data frames through a declarative domain language. So thanks for your attention and any questions. Okay. So we got this what the uh, main point I, why I wanted to show the demo. I want to uh, show the HTOP with all the cluster. So that's what I really like. If you have once, um, yeah, talk to a cluster with 160 nodes and one terabyte of RAM, that's funny. <laughs> so any actual questions? Then if you get any other questions, come to our booth, come to the other talks, and come to me, see me around. Great. Thank you, Peter, again.